it's um it's eleven fifteen. All right. Well, I'd like to welcome you all to TCF and to my talk, an introduction to generative adversarial networks or GANs. I'll be using the kind of the acronym GAM, GANs uh, com fairly commonly today. My name is Larry Perlstein. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at the College of New Jersey. Actually, our previous speaker uh, called us by our old name, Trenton State College. But, uh, today, we are known as the College of New Jersey. Can everybody hear me OK in the back? I can't quite tell exactly how far I need to go on the mic. Um, so um, kind of moving on here, let's see if this uh, going to play right. OK. So I have some pictures here on my um, home screen. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these later, but you can just think about what this is kind of showing and recall that when we get to it. And actually, maybe we don't need to have this on. All right, and these images actually were created with Adobe Firefly, which is a text to uh, image generative adversarial, uh, not adversarial, it's a generative uh, type of AI. So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of background on AI terminology, and uh, I'll talk in a little bit of detail about the relationship between real neurons, the neurons that are in human brains, and artificial neurons, the kind that we use for pretty much everything today. I'll give a brief history of deep learning neural networks. Actually, um, our previous speaker, Dr. Marin, uh, spoke about this a little bit. I'm going to give a bit of a more um, uh, direct and um, specific uh, history, which I think is very interesting to get a feel for how we got to where we are today. And I'll talk about the basics of the generative adversarial networks and to give an example of a GAN. And then I'll talk a little bit about my work. So I do research involving these generative adversarial networks and a couple of the applications that I've been looking at, a little bit of intro into some of the other GANs that people are using. And finally, some words from Dr. Jeffrey Hinton um, regarding AI, which I think is interesting, not specifically related to GANs, but related to a lot of the recent developments in AI. Maybe I'll move the spotlight on to the side for you. Um, so uh, the first question is about um, taxonomy. And I guess the first question I have for you all is what do you think of if someone could give me a little bit of feedback when you hear AI, artificial intelligence, what is it that you think of? What, what do you think is the definition of artificial intelligence? A machine with the ability to learn? Great, yeah, somebody in the back, yes. An imitation of filling in a blank? An imitation of? An imitation filling in a blank. Filling in a blank, yeah, excellent, yes. I think that humans can do better than a machine. Sir. Anything that, well, that humans can today do better than a machine? Yes. The idea. Yeah, so those are all great, and the reality is there really is no single accepted definition of AI. People use the term all the time. And actually, as it turns out, I'm going to talk about some of these layers of um, classification of this kind of technology. We have AI, we have ML, machine learning, which is also used, deep learning, and data science. And um, as it turns out, when people say AI today, they're usually referring to what we would say is deep learning. And that's the area that I'm going to be talking about. So um, the the he said, I'm going to be talking about today, the generative adversarial networks is a subset of deep learning. It's a it's an application, you might say, or a, a specific framework for deep learning. It lives with inside machine learning, which lives in the general concept of uh, artificial intelligence. Machine learning refers to any kind of data processing where uh, instead of having a fixed algorithm to do the data processing, essentially the algorithm learns from data. So machine learning is most generally applied to any kind of uh, system or framework where the actual processing of future data depends on what previous data the system or algorithm has seen. 
Deep learning involves specifically multi-layer neural networks and usually convolutional. Dr. Marin talked a little bit about convolutional networks. I'm gonna say a little bit about convolutional networks. I'm not gonna go into the details. This is not gonna be super technical, but if anybody has specific questions about that, I'm happy to go into it. Um, and um, although the, um, a lot of the networks that people use today, although they're deep learning, deep networks are not convolutional. Um, typically, well, I'll, I'll get to that. So at the core of modern AI is the artificial neuron. Like I said, when people say AI today, they usually mean neural networks, uh, just like Dr. Marin was speaking about. And, and I think everyone today is going to be speaking about things that are related to neural networks, whether even they say it or not. Um, and the neuron, uh, the artificial neuron is based on a primitive understanding of the neurons in human brains and actually in, in uh, all mammals. And some of this was, uh, was some of this uh, understanding was obtained by, uh, by experiments involving um, mammal subjects and so forth. Uh, what we're seeing here in the upper right-hand corner is a reconstruction of some human interconnected neurons from brain tissue that was obtained by very thin slices and staining and computer reconstruction. Um, underneath that on the bottom right is a, uh, is a sketch of two neurons. And on the left side is a neuron that's sending, that's activated and it's sending. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll just to, and, um, I'm no expert in biology, but this is, the, I'll give you, you know, a little bit of a very primitive understanding of how this stuff works. Um, you see that little circle, that's the, uh, the, the center, the core, the nucleus of the neuron cell. And the, uh, the, the firing of the neuron is directed from there. The action potential goes down. The axon, that long, thin kind of uh, process, and the axon terminals are where a given neuron connects to other neurons and across synapses to the dendrites of the next neuron. So what we're showing here is the left neuron is firing. It's sending the signal to the right neuron, and that's the receiving cell. Um, the influence from one neuron to another, whether one nor neuron is firing whether and how it relates to whether the next neuron is firing, it can be either excitatory, meaning that a positive firing of the left neuron might tend to make the right neuron fire, be on, or it could be inhibitory, meaning a positive firing of the left neuron could actually inhibit the firing of the right neuron. Um, at this point, I don't plan on saying anything else about biology. We're going to move over to the actual artificial neuron that everything today that you see is based on. The only thing that's different um, in some of the different implementations are this one piece over here, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the neuron basically just has two pieces, the artificial neuron. It has this summing junction. This is a big Greek sigma, which represents summation. And we have a bunch of inputs from other neurons coming in. And we can see on the arcs that connect each of the other neurons to our big summing junction, we have weights. So I have here W0, W1, Wn. This is as far as the mathematics is going to go. Uh, these are weights, and these determine what the influence of these other neurons are on what this neuron does. So all these weighted contributions, and you can think of each of these as being approximately zero or one. Each of these other neurons are either firing or not firing. And then how much they influence this neuron depends on the settings of these weights. If these weights are positive, they're excitatory. If they're negative, they're inhibitory. And, um, and this second piece of the neuron is what's called the, um, uh, the activation function. So I'm showing here a stair-step function where if the sum here is negative, it, it puts out a zero. If the sum here is positive, it puts out a one. But activation functions that are a little bit more smooth are common, or in fact, the most common activation function is, uh, is, is something a little bit different from that. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details, uh, but this was the initial model that was developed for the um, artificial neuron, and it served quite well. And it's, a, it's very good for understanding how everything works. Uh, I should say that I'm willing to take questions at any time. I'll, I'll make my responses brief, so we'll move things along pretty quickly. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to stop me. All right. Um, so here's my brief history of AI and neural networks, the ups and downs. And 
Uh, at the very top of the slide, I have this kind of, you can see this kind of wiggly function. And that is my personal view of kind of the level of optimism or enthusiasm that there was in the world about the future of neural networks and this kind of processing. Uh, things got started in the early 1940s and it had periods where there was a great deal of excitement about this and troughs were basically uh, nobody wanted to be involved in this at all. And I'll talk a little bit about um, what caused some of those things. And we're currently in a very major upswing, as you probably know, that this is you know, one of the hottest topics in technology today. So let's see where things got started. So the original artificial neuron um, that we all reference was developed by McCullough and Pitts in the early 1940s. And, um, and that's that picture that I showed over there. In 1950, Alan Turing, who is often considered the father of artificial intelligence, the father of computer science, um, came up with the Turing test, which is a description of how we might be able to determine whether an, a, um, a, a, a machine has attained a level of intelligence, which we would say is indistinguishable from a human. I'm not gonna go through all these, uh, just for the high points. In 1958, Rosenblatt developed what was called the perceptron and the perceptron training algorithm. And uh, this work was done at Dartmouth and was funded by the US Navy. There was a huge amount of money that went into this and a great deal of enthusiasm generated, uh, but it really ultimately did not deliver on the promises. And actually uh, it's kind of um, maybe sort of leads naturally to the next milestone, which was 1969. At MIT, Seymour, uh, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Packard, who are kind of luminaries in the field of artificial intelligence, wrote a book called Perceptrons. And it was uh, in that book, they very clearly articulated a core problem with the perceptron, the artificial neural network as it had been conceived to that date. And that was that it could not solve what was known as the exclusive OR problem, the XOR problem. And this was really not something that, that Minsky and Pepper, you know, it wasn't any genius insight that they discovered it, but for whatever reason, when they sort of put it down to black and white, uh, it put the kibosh on all kinds of, any future work, and I shouldn't say any future work, but for a decade or more, uh, any real work in uh, neural networks, it would have been, you would have been embarrassed to be working in the field after this book came out. Um, so, um, and I just say the XOR problem, I'm not gonna go into the details. It's a very simple trivial problem. You can kind of see if, uh, if you can sort of picture the diagram up there that the line connects to, there are the blue dots, there's sort of two sets of blue dots and two sets of orange dots. The idea is, to, to classify these appropriately, to, to, the, to create a, um, a process that can classify. This is a trivial problem to be solved in a few lines of computer code. It's a trivial problem to be solved by a human, uh, but, but the basic perceptron was unable to solve it. And by, by articulating this so clearly, that's what really threw cold water on AI and neural networks for a long, long time. Yes. Um. What are your thoughts on reverse Turing tests and how they're going in the future? I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. Uh, you're can't, telling can't. If, if a set of data is generated by a computer or a human. Huh. I, I, actually, I, oh, I see. Yeah. I really can't. That's a great question. And I, I, I mean, I think if we have time, we can have a conversation about that. But um, it's a good question. Yeah, question. Is you talking about captures? Capture, yeah. yeah capture. So uh, machines are too good at this. So like when you move a mouse to, to hit the button, they go in a straight line rather I than- I know how they, I'm aware how they work. I'm curious about what is the future of it because it's getting it's, very, it's a hot topic for plagiarism evaluations and, and all the papers. Right, you know. right, yeah. I'm, I, it's not an area that I really can, can speak about, but it's a great topic. It's great. All I know is I can never do those things. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> Pick out all the traffic ones. Uh, oh, yeah, I know, exactly. So the next thing, I, if you saw it bounce in, was this thing called expert systems. Are, are folks out there, probably some of you remember when expert systems were really hot. I'll see some hands. 
Uh, I, it was around 1980s. In the 1980s, I was graduating as an undergraduate, and it was all the rage, everything, but was excited that expert systems were going to solve all of our problems. And the idea was to capture domain knowledge, the knowledge of domain experts in if, if then type of constructs. And, uh, and that was going to solve all of our problems. And the big um, example, the demonstration of that technology that was held up in, in 1982 was that Campbell Soup had now an AI that could cook tomato soup in Camden. So I wasn't super impressed. And I, I kind of had the general feeling that it was hmm, maybe a solution in search of a problem or something like that. It just didn't seem like it was going to live up to its hype. And it really didn't. Um, uh, so then, uh, fast forward, I guess, a little bit to 1986, when um, uh, Rumble Hart and then Jeffrey Hinton and Williams published a paper on backpropagation and multi-layer perceptrons. So by adding that extra hidden layer that Dr. Marin talked about, actually, you can prove theor theoretically that not only are... So Minsky and Papert basically laid out that these things were impotent, they could, they could do nothing. And in fact, they're omnipotent. So you can prove that all you have to do is add that extra layer and a neural network can classify anything and can do regression on anything. You, you need an all knowing being to train it, and we'll talk about training, but at least theoretically, these things could solve any problem. Uh, and that really led to a huge, I should say, that led to a huge upswing. Uh, Rommel Hart's paper in 85, 86, um, and I was in grad school at the time, and I was learning the classical techniques for doing computer vision and signal processing and so forth. And I was enamored of all that. And, and I just thought this stuff will never amount to anything. And actually, I was right uh, for about 20 years, and then I was completely wrong. <laughs> so um, what came next um, is AlexNet. Actually, I went a little bit farther than I wanted to. But um, AlexNet in 2012 is really what changed the world. Before AlexNet, um, Jan LeCun at, at NYU, New York University, is now at Facebook, um, also had developed some very useful uh, deep networks that were doing uh, isolated digit recognition for the post office. Uh, but the real breakthrough happened in 2012 when Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Sutskiver, and Jeffrey Hinton at University of Toronto presented their paper uh, on AlexNet uh, at the uh, ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. This is a, an annual event that was held in the computer vision field. And for the first time, a pure neural network approach won the day, and it won by a lot. So um, this just changed everything. All of a sudden, all those classical approaches that people you know, spent years writing dissertations on and learning all these uh, you know, obscure, um, but you know, really uh, powerful mathematical techniques for doing analysis and ad hoc techniques, um, those were now completely overtaken by neural networks. And since 2012, pretty much anyone in computer vision is doing um, all their work based on neural networks. And I guess I'm um, moving ahead a little bit. So we had GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, being introduced by Goodfellow in 2014. Ian Goodfellow writes, uh, has written a textbook, actually, that my students are using in my class this semester. And then GPT-1, the generative pre-trained transformer, was introduced in 2018. And of course, that led to ChatGPT, which is probably what has brought a lot of you out here, which has um, really um, captured the imagination of, of so many people. So um, it's really... Uh, you know, probably a lot of folks have kind of not been um, uh, all that focused on AI, but in the last couple of years, I think it's changed a lot of our lives. Uh, it's really some amazing stuff. I, for one, have used it to write um, funny poetry and limericks that I've sent as birthday cards. So I, I just think it's very cool stuff. All right. So um, what I want to say is that artificial neural networks are trainable. And um, specifically, that the neural network, so the neural network is this complex processing thing, but I'm going to talk about, you know, it's not really that complex from a standpoint of what it does and how one uses it. That network is defined by the settings of the weight. So I showed that picture of one neuron and had the W0, W1, all the way up to WN. And there could be a few weights, there could be dozens of weights, there could be thousands of weights. So um, there could be a few to billions of these, and you can think of these weights as knobs. So this is just a, a, a kind of a cartoon that I generated, but 
The idea is the neural network is this complex machine that we really can't understand. We, I mean, that's one of the problems of neural networks is, you know, although we do some work and I've done work and, and some, you know, really impressive people have done great work in visualizing, trying to understand what's going on inside. The honest truth is, I don't think that anybody really knows um, what's going on inside. It's one of the, the outstanding problems in, uh, in neural networks. Yes, question in the back. Defines the ways. That great question. We're getting to that. So, um, what this sort of complex machine does is it takes an input at the at the it takes uh, inputs. Let's say on the left hand side, it produces outputs on the right hand side. And the inputs might be, for example, images. Some of the work that I've done is things like classifying. So the ImageNet um, challenge gave a million images. And so you'd apply an image of a cat and you'd expect it to say cat at the output, but sometimes it'll say dog. You apply an image of a dog, of a person holding a sea bass or a brook trout or, or a backhoe or you know, a giraffe or whatever. There's all these million different, not million, there's a million different images, but 1,000 different classes. And the, the weights are set. The question was, how are the weights set? How are these parameters set? They're set by a training process. I'm not gonna go into details, but the training process it uses that technique called backpropagation, the same technique that was developed in 1985 is still used today. It uses a technique called gradient descent. That, that may be something that, you know, if you're not really in the field, that might not mean anything to you, but it's a very simple, it's like the, the simplest possible technique for optimizing a function. So it uses these optimizers, which are very simple uh, uh, algorithms that look for uh, the minimum of a function by using the its derivative, its uh, you know the slope of the function, and trying to find the minimum of a of a cost function. So we have these uh, potentially uh, billions of weights, um, and uh, and those are uh, determined by by training by showing examples cat. You know, and then if it doesn't say cat, it adapts to say make it more likely to say cat. Um, so these neural nets can be used to classify, estimate, predict, but also generate. I'm going to talk about the generating. And the weights are based on gener are, are based on this training data, and we can think of this as learning by example. So that's how this, this works. So it's not a human that's turning all these knobs. It's just repetitive application of training data. And this is what's called supervised learning. There are other kinds of um, techniques that are used, but supervised learning is I would say the, the primary technique that's used um, in a lot of the, the types of networks and AIs that you're gonna hear talk about today. Um, all right, so the next topic I wanna talk about is that networks have layers. So um, as we all know, onions have layers, and what do you think is coming next? Ogres have layers. Is anybody with me here on this? I don't know. If you're not with me so far, um, maybe ask your grandchildren. So, okay. Um, so you might say the next thing naturally would be parfait has layers, but that's not where I'm going with this. So neural networks have layers too. Uh, this is a picture of an AlexNet. And actually, I'll just go to the next slide where I have a blow up of an AlexNet. Um, so here's the network that was... Uh, that was uh, won the day in 2012. The networks that we have today are actually vastly more complex than this. Um, actually, I'm gonna get back. Right. Okay, so uh, we have RGB images coming into this network. So red, green, blue images coming in. The, the AlexNet was uh, designed to take images in at 224 by 224 pixels. It's medium high resolution, certainly not high definition, but Actually, it's sufficient resolution to convey the information that was needed to win the competition, uh, which is to come up with the, uh, the classifications. So the output, we have 1,000 outputs. We have one output for each of the classes. So the AlexNet was designed for this challenge that had 1,000 classes. And every one of these outputs works like a probability estimate. So at each of these outputs, so one of these outputs is dedicated for cat, one is dedicated for dog and sea bass and brook trout and giraffe and backhoe and whatever the thousand classes are. And when you apply an image at the input, uh, well, I'll have a little picture here. Um, so the data percolates through the network. It's just a speed forward approach and then comes out and it drives all these outputs. And so you put in a picture of a cat here, it might say that the probability of cat is 0.4, 
but the probability of dog is 0.3 and the probability of goldfish is 0.2 and then maybe a few other probabilities. So if the top probability is cat, we're gonna say cat, even if it's not saying 90% sure on the cat, if the highest probability is cat, then I'm gonna say cat. That's just the way these things are normally used. But basically these outputs um, indicate probabilities. Um, so uh, my daughter asked, uh, so well, let me just, before I go to that. So in the middle are these things that are called convolutional layers. Excuse me, and all I'm gonna say about convolutional layers is that a convolutional layer is a one of the layers in this network that takes in images and puts out images. So things that are related spatially to where the objects that were the features in an image were. So all these convolutional layers, and AlexNet had five convolutional layers, some of the modern convolution, some of the modern deep networks for image processing have um, have upwards of uh, over 100 convolutional layers. Um, and then there's one other type of layers of layer, and that's called the fully connected layer. And these are just sort of straight line linear layers of just plain old neurons. And so between the convolutional layers and the linear layers, there's kind of a rearrangement. At the very last layer here, there's a seven by seven array of of pixels, but those are all just kind of strung into a single line and they are applied to these um, linear fully connected layers. And that's the whole thing, right? There's really, you now know what a neuron is and you know what a neural network is and you pretty much know everything. Uh, so my daughter asked me, well, why do you put so many layers here? And uh, maybe she didn't realize, but, I, but as I told you all, all you need actually are these two layers in here. And mathematically you can show that if you put enough neurons in those two layers, you can, this network can classify anything. Um, but it turns out that there is, uh, a, it's just been found empirically that it's useful to make deeper networks rather than uh, kind of wider networks, which might be the alternative. And one of the things that motivates this, and my daughter was unhappy to hear this, but it was experiments that were carried on, carried out on the vision system of cats by instrumenting their brains and seeing that the, the, their vision system worked in these layers so that the, the first layers in the um, uh, visual cortex process very simple features. So the early layers process simple features so that if you put uh, something that had a horizontal edge, it would excite certain neurons. If you put something that had a vertical edge, it would excite other neurons. A diagonal edge would excite other neurons. Things that were sort of circular, it would excite other, and so forth. So um, these things turn out to be these early, and, and as we train these networks, let me back up for a second, just say, so they, there are these multiple layers in the mammals, including the human's uh, visual cortex. And so this is kind of mimicking that, this multiple layer approach, this hierarchical approach, and these features get ever more sort of complex as they get, they get um, as we move down in the network. I mean, somewhere deep in this network, they've shown that there are neurons that, that when you train it on the ImageNet set, <clears throat> excuse me, it fires when you see something that looks like a dog snout. So something that sort of looks like there's two eyes and sort of a nose, and it doesn't have to be a dog. There are things in other things in the world that sort of somehow look like that, and that neuron gets, gets you know fired on that. So like deep in the network, um, you have these things that, that are a lot higher level of understanding, but in the early in the network are things that are very simple features, like I said, like simple edges and so forth. Um, so yeah, that, and that's why that we have these deep networks because they were motivated by the mammal's brain um, and also uh, uh, they turn out to be effective like that. Uh, Dr. Marin mentioned that the number of uh, parameters that we have, these number of weights that we have in networks today has gone all the way up to the range of trillions. Uh, in 2012, here's a logarithmic graph, but in 2012, AlexNet had about 62 million weights, so one of these light blue dots. The light blue dots represent vision systems, computer vision, which AlexNet was one. Um, the uh, orange dots represent these image generation systems, things like uh, text to image and the red dots represent the text processing system. So the most complex systems today are these uh, text processing and natural language processing systems. So finally, we get to games, the basic idea of the game. So um, just as a, a yes. Um, I had a quick question on the previous uh, slide that you had, which is, um, are each of these layers representing, representing uh, 
a unique attribute that it's trying to figure out, right? Is that how to think about that? Um, well, the thing is that the layers can do whatever they need to do. So, you know, the network designer, and I will also say that today the network designer is sometimes a machine as well, but normally it's a human that decides like sort of the structure of the network. And then we just let it go. We give it the pictures or whatever we're going to give it. And we train it and we let it optimize its, its uh, uh, objective function. So what those layers are going to be, it's, you can't say for sure. It really depends on what your inputs are and what your desired outputs are. That's what's going to drive it. I will say that for the purposes of image processing, people have found that the matter, I mean, it's like, I don't want to say too strongly, but it's pretty much what people in the field say, is it doesn't matter where you start with, that first layer always looks the same. It always looks like these simple edge detectors of different orientation angles, um, some simple like blob detectors of different fundamental colors, and some kind of uh, circular arc detectors. And that's kind of what they look like. What goes on inside the network beyond that, you can't really say in general. There's no, there's at least, I mean, I, I'm, I just don't, I am unable to put in uh, any kind of useful description because it really depends on the training. I mean, we know we can visualize to some extent what goes on, like I said, with dogs now. So there are ways of getting a feel of what's, what these things are looking at, but um, what it's going to be for a given problem, you can't know. For the ImageNet, yes, we know what AlexNet, we've, there's been a lot of work in looking inside of AlexNet for image, for that image net million pictures. But um, but in general, you just can't say. It really depends. There are two questions. Yeah, George. Yeah. So the back, back propagation is done on all layers at a time, not, that, not a single layer. That is correct. So you start at the end. So back propagation starts at the end. And actually, the point of it is that it uses um, it uses the chain rule in calculus to go back from the to the end back to the beginning. So it reuses derivatives that are computed in the back end to compute uh, derivatives in the front end. And I'll tell you the reason why I was wondering about single layers is because you brought up the point that the, you know, doing feature expression like the, the horizontal lines that, right. that uh, well, that you've been training it for that at a single layer at a time, but that's not the case. That's right. You're simultaneously optimizing all the layers. However, I will say that there have been folks who have advocated freezing layers and not training all the layers simultaneously. So as you can imagine, one thing I didn't mention, but you probably have an idea that since 2012, uh, I have a plot that I don't have today, but in some of my talks I've shown, where if you look at the number of papers that have been published in the field, my society is the Institute for Electrical Electronics Engineers. The number of papers has gone like more or less flat until 2012, and then it's like a hockey stick. So there's just, uh, you know, there's everything you can imagine is being tried and has been tried, and only a relatively small number of things sort of break through. But anyway, one of the concepts that people look at is freezing some layers and not training everything simultaneously. I had a couple other questions, one in the back. Yeah, uh, just in, in terms of those intermediate layers, at, you know, in, in training a network for like image detection. Right. Uh, I find that the best way of understanding what's going on in those intermediate layers is looking at what happens when you train a human neural network, you know, just training human brains. So children learning to draw, you know, start off with very simplified shapes, you know, stick figures and, and you know, little stick flowers or whatever. And, and that's what those intermediate layers in the neural network are. It's the simplifications of objects. And so you can, you can, you, you know, you can always compare training a digital neural network training a human neural network. So it's getting sort of fine grain with every layer. Is that yeah. and, and as an artist improves in their skill, they learn to uh, you know add more and more of those layers, like paying in, uh, closer attention to shading and, and edge detection, curve profiles, all those things. That's that's what training neural network is, right? Yeah. Thank you. So a couple other questions here. Does the A adversarial mean again? So the question is, what does adversarial mean again? We're going to get to that in just one minute. Uh, there was another question. Yeah. Instead of trying to figure out post hoc what um, um, the sort of latent uh, elements of a plot of generalized uh, nodes means, couldn't you actually say, okay, you got to look at feathers versus fur versus skin versus this? You guys look at sort of legs versus arms versus things, and then you have some sort of understanding of what they're really doing. Well, I'll be honest with you, what you described, what you're describing is kind of what we would say like 
hand tailored uh, feature design. Uh, and that's what was overtaken in 2012. So that's kind of where everybody had gotten to, where all that kind of complexity, you try to use the human understanding of the problem you're trying to solve and create algorithms to detect those things. And you can do that and they weren't, they weren't completely unsuccessful, but it turns out it's just way more efficient to just let the machine do it. The downside is we don't know how it works, but, but and there are a few other downsides, but. Um, at any rate, why don't I, well, yeah, I'll take one more quick question. But. Just a clarification, is yeah. when, when, when the, the slide with the number of parameters, those are yeah. the fuzzy numbers going, uh, going into a, a neural network. So the, the, um, the, the number of parameters has to, the total number of weights that's represented in here, it looks like my, I don't know, this is just not strong enough of a laser pointer, but um, in this neural network, um, you know, all these layers have, have neurons. And there are um, millions of neurons in here. And, um, and like I said, in this particular network, there's 62 million weights. So that's, it's the weights that, that feed from each, all the sort of connected neurons to a given neuron. Those are the things that are those billion or trillion parameters that I'm talking about. All right, so I, I, I want to just keep going just in the interest of time. Um, and get to the generative adversarial network. So, so to, to get the general idea, if you imagine a giant bingo spinner, and in the cage is not bingo balls, but balls that have some, let's say for, this is just for the, for the very simplest understanding, just some numbers on them, some sets of numbers that you're gonna pull out of a bingo cage. And in advance, you have no idea what you're gonna find. You might find numbers from minus a million to a million or from minus a million to minus 999,000. You have no idea, but you're going to start pulling some balls out. And you pull these following uh, values, 2, 5, 8, 11, 13, 34, 40, 46, 52, 56, 63. Because I don't know if that means anything to anybody. We're all going to say in a minute what, that, what the significance of those particular numbers is. But the point is, my question is, given that you pulled out some, some of these numbers from this bingo spinner, um, would you, what would you guess what other numbers might be in that that thing. So we're just pulling some things out at random. And what do you imagine? Like, what else would you think? If I pulled the next ball, what do you think you might find? Give me an example of what you might find. Oh, yeah, exactly. A number between zero and 63 or two, maybe 17, 20, 25. You know, would you pick 5.5? A human probably wouldn't. You'd probably recognize that all these numbers are integers and you might not. Um, you know, a, a machine might not notice that they're all integers and just say, okay, these numbers are between two and 63, but that's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a thought. And, um, you know, what about zero or one? That's to the left of all the numbers or 70, which is to the right of all the numbers. You might not choose those, maybe. Um, well, so it turns out there's really no fixed right answer to this question. I mean, we've just observed a bunch of these numbers. We really have no idea, but all these answers are reasonable. They're possible as sort of answers to what else is in there. Uh, but the real question is in terms of the, the GAN uh, approaches for the algorithm that we use to pick those other numbers. The whole point of the GAN is to somehow infer what the probability distribution is of all the balls in that cage, just from looking at some finite subset of them. That's the goal. And it's impossible to do um, in some optimal way. It's the, the real question is, is your approach actually useful for the problem you're trying to solve? And I will say that for these particular numbers, they happen to be the, 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 the streets, the stops on the Market Street line in Philadelphia, for anybody who knows. Uh, and the missing numbers were 15, 30, 60, and 69. So not to say, you know, that was really just as a, an example, but in the real world, typically what we do is we observe a bunch of images and we try to figure out what are the other images that, that might have been in that distribution. Or we might observe um, uh, other kinds of signals, uh, like audio signals or, um, or even text. So, um, so we have examples of any kind of data. It could be images, audio, video. The numbers was just a very simple thing to get to imagining. Uh, maybe we could also think about proteins, viruses, tweets, or novels. And the goal is to infer the probability distribution, like I said, from which these examples were drawn, and then have the ability to now draw an unlimited number of new samples from that probability distribution. One of the, this has different applications. One of the applications for this actually is to train other neural networks. And I'll talk a little bit about that because it's something that I've uh, done. 
So the general generative adversarial network is a two player game. And the two players are the first player is the counterfeiter and we nicknamed the counterfeiter the generator. And this is this picture that I came up with um, for a counterfeiter, the generator, and the second agent, the second uh, person or um, uh, unit in this game is the counterfeit detector, which is nicknamed the generator. So we have the, the discriminator, I'm sorry. So we have the generator and we have the discriminator, the, the counterfeit generator and the counterfeit discriminator. And in a GAN, they're both actually just pure neural networks. These are just pure neural networks. So teaching the discriminator. So we, um, so here's a little bit of a view of all this. We have here we have the generator. So I'm going to talk about teaching the discriminator. But we have the generator. It's generating in this case pictures, and it's generating fake pictures. And I have my little poop emoji here. And then I have actual real stuff. Actually, this is an image I got from the US Mint. These are actual pictures of real $100 bills. And uh, this is my real stuff. So the, the point of this is that we feed both of these into the discriminator and we tell the discriminator, this is fake and this is real. So we feed the discriminator examples of both of these. So this is where the adversarial part comes in. And we train the discriminator. This is a neural network that processes images. We train it to be able to distinguish between the real and the fake. And all it has is a one bit at, uh, at the output, a, one, a flag that says real or fake. And it might be right, it might be wrong. And then we have this scorekeeper that tells us whether or not we're right or, or we're wrong. So this is the discriminator. Um, so we train the discriminator to maximize the percent correct. In other words, maximize the probability that we're going to find that the generator is producing fakes and that the, the actual pictures are real. Any questions at this moment? This is where we're going. Yes. Is it fair to say that this is more a method of training neural networks than a type of neural network itself? You could say that. I mean, the types of neural networks are would we would just sort of categorize the networks. I'm going to talk about examples that would be in this discriminator in this generator. But you're right. This is well, it's a bigger framework. But we, it's not just simply a method of training. It's really that framework that goes around it. This adversarial approach is a kind of a bit of a meta framework. I mean, the whole thing could be considered a neural network. It's still a network. It has, uh, it has an ultimate um, kind of scorekeeping. Um, so it's not in a, you know, in some way, it's not distinguishable from any other neural network, but it's uh, it composed of these two specific phases. Oh, I will say uh, before I move on, is that the poop, poop emoji, as it turns out, I was just looking for one that I could use. And I, I will say that I try to give attribution whenever I find something that, you know, I don't want to just use somebody else's image without giving attribution. This is actually um, from Walmart. It's a edible cake topper, frosting sheet. So if anybody's interested in such a thing, you can go and buy this. So that's what I used when I searched for poop, poop emojis. All right. Anyway, so here's the generator. This is now how we train the generator. Um, so now that we don't care about the real pictures at all, when we train the generator, we just take the fakes, we apply them to the discriminator, and um, uh, we tell the discriminator actually that, um, well, you can either tell them it's real or it's fake. You just have to keep track of whether you want to sort of maximize the, how many it gets wrong or how many it gets right. If we say that, well, let me, I don't want to confuse things. Let's just say that we're telling the discriminator that these are fakes, and we want to maximize the percent wrong. So we want to maximize, we want to, so this um, training has to do with updating the generator. So when we did phase one, we're updating the weights in the discriminator. In phase two, we're updating the weights in the generator. And we feed the output of the generator to the discriminator, and we update the weights by knowing, by getting feedback on how slight changes of the weights in the generator will tend to make the score worse. So we're trying to maximize how many it gets wrong, if that makes sense. So that's where the adversarial part comes in. So we train the discriminator to be able to do a good job. We train the generator to kind of make the discriminator do a bad job. And here's a, a view of a model. I'm not going to go into you know, super details, but a model of a discriminator. Um, it's just a convolutional neural network. It has RGB images in. So you can imagine discriminator takes in the discriminator, oops, just go back. It takes in images and it puts out a zero or a one, whether it's a real or fake. So uh, 
at the input, it takes in an image, a, an RGB image in, in this case, 128 by 128. And at the output, it has a single one bit um, output. And in between are these convolutional downscaling layers. So actually it's a pure neural network. Um, and there can be, um, it doesn't have to be a pure, well, it is a pure neural network. It doesn't have to be purely convolutional. It can also have um, these linear, fully connected layers as well. But in this case, we just have uh, convolutional. And actually at the end, we just do a single sort of trivial convolution where we just basically, it's it's as if it's a, it's essentially a fully connected, you know, linear, even though it's not the way it's described. Um, so for the generator, we take in, well, this is an interesting piece that maybe wouldn't have been, you wouldn't imagine. And this is kind of the, one of the twists here, is that the input to the generator is a 400 point random vector. Where does 400 come from? It's just kind of a, um, you know, you can pick it out of thin air. I, when I did an example I'm gonna show you, I started with 100. You know, the, it's it's very just experimental. Um, it, it needs to be of sufficiently high dimension that it can allow you to sort of create random numbers in a very high dimensional space. So 400, 1,000, 100, somewhere in the range of 100 to 1,000 random numbers. So the input to this network is 1,000 or 400, in my case, 400 random numbers. It's kind of crazy to imagine this. We just pick random numbers using a pseudo-random number generator. We put them in the network goes through all this convolutions and upscaling, and at the output, we get an RGB image. So this network, we adjust the weights so that when you put in a random number, a set of random, a lot of random numbers, which you can think about this, if 400 random numbers, you think about it, imagine a 400 dimensional space. So we can add easily, a two dimensional space is a plane, and a, a, a three dimensional space is the space that we live in, but uh, it's a little hard to imagine 400 dimensional space, but mathematically, it's, this is what it is. And a random vector is a single point in 400 dimensional space. You pick any given point and it's gonna produce some particular image at the output. And we train the weights so that the image if it produces the output for any random number that you give it is gonna somehow look, um, what should I say, spiritually similar to a picture that it has seen that were real pictures. We're trying to fool it, to, to uh, tell it from any given random number that it can possibly get any point in that portrait dimensional space to produce a picture that somehow looks in some way unrecognizable from a real picture. It doesn't mean it's the same, it just means that it fools the discriminator into thinking it, it's a real picture. So uh, here's the example I gave. Uh, so what was your favorite Super Bowl? Ed? Well, I, uh, I'll pick three or four. Budweiser silk pajamas sliding out window. That was a great one. Yeah. What else? Oh, the, the uh, Christopher Walken. Oh, I thought that was a great one. Yeah. Yeah. In the back. The yeah. uh, Jason Momoa and Zach Rap one with uh, Jennifer Beals. Uh, interesting. Yeah, that's what my daughter said. Yeah. Uh, what? Anybody else? All right. My favorite one was the one that was about uh, like a good neighbor. Neighbor. I said neighbor. Well, anyway, uh, that uh, that influenced what I decided to do for the uh, example here. So um, I trained again, um, and I wanted to see what it would do on on this with this motivation. Uh, so what am I showing you here? I'm showing you 25 images that are coming out of the generator, and they're coming from 25 random vectors, 400 point random vectors. And you're seeing the network evolve uh, as it goes through the training to try to fool the discriminator. And what we're seeing here on the right-hand side are the plots of how well the generator and the discriminator are doing. So the blue line represents the generator. The red line represents the discriminator. 0.5 means that it gets 50% of things right. Question. What is it like the discriminator? What is it trying to, is it trying to create an image from this ad or something? Uh, no. So actually what I did was I scraped Google for 350 pictures uh, that, with the keyword Arnold Schwarzenegger. I scraped for 350 pictures with the keyword Danny DeVito. I took those 700 images together and that's what I used to train this. So, so this, the discriminator is looking at 700 pictures uh, with DeVito and Schwarzenegger, some of them with both of them, um, just because they're related obviously too. Uh, and um, 
And uh, that's what the that's what the set of images. Normally, you would use a lot more images than that, but this was actually sort of a convenient set um, just to do some kind of training. Um, and so you can see that actually, I don't know if you can look really carefully, but in the beginning of time, actually, the generator was doing pretty well. And yeah. after a period of time, the discriminator caught up and figured out and started doing a lot better than 50%. 50% would be a coin flip, right? So if the discriminator was like completely unsure, um, it would come up with, uh, it would be right half of the time. You could just say, you know, uh, true or false every time, and then it would be 50% correct. Uh, question, yes. Um, this is saying garbage in, garbage out. Yes. True for a lot of things, especially training. And there's been some articles on uh, the internet about ChatGPT and other large language models getting worse over time. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, yes. Gibberish or, 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 or responses. And um, is there an upper limit to what element, LMs or AI in this? Generally, can do. Um, it's a great question. Um, you know, when, where people have gone, I'm, again, I probably don't have a great answer to you, but um, what people have done is created bigger and bigger models with more and more neurons. And you might think that the bigger the model, the better it's going to perform. And the, the one of the big hazards in any kind of machine learning, and especially neural networks, is the problem of overfitting the data. So if you have a model that's incredibly rich, that can represent so, so much. One of the problems is that you learn only the training data and it turns out it's useless for doing anything beside the training data. So for the purpose of GANs, one of the problems that you can get, my goal is here, is to be able to generate any image that somehow will look like Danny DeVito or Arnold Schwarzenegger, but not just the 700 images that it got, it got as inputs, but all kinds of sort of variations in some way without saying exactly what does that even mean? But that's kind of what these GANs can do for images. Um, but one of the problems you can have is where it actually, all these 25 will look the same. So one possible thing is it'll just figure out one image that actually was a real image and be able to create that. Or be able to um, create you know some subset of the real images and only copy them, but not make new things. So there is the potential. So anyway, your question was, is there a hazard that as we get more and more training data, we have a problem? Um, usually getting more data is a good thing. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I've heard the same thing that you've talked about. I, 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 uh, I recall reading about this. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's because, like you said, garbage in, garbage out. If, you, if the new data that comes in is really not good. And of course, one of the big problems with large language models is that they can reflect some of the same problems of various biases and um, uh, you know, and uh, wrong information or, you know, sort of, I don't know how to say it, but like, you know, uh, fake information and things like that. So anything that people have generated, I mean, it's, you know, these large language models are trained on whatever's publicly available. And, you know, there's good things that are publicly available and bad things are publicly available. So um, it's not necessarily trained on everything that humans ever talk about. It's not aware of the things that we talk about verbally. It only is aware of the things we've ever typed in and they're retained on the internet. So anyway, I don't have a great answer, I don't think, but um, uh, there definitely is a potential problem as you get bigger and bigger models. I will say usually getting more data, if it's good data, is a good thing. I, I think nobody would turn down good data, except that it takes time to use it. Sorry, just to clarify. So with hardware, there's Moore's law. We're reaching the peak. With Absolutely, law. we're pretty much. Is there an equivalent yeah. of Moore's law for AI? Yeah, I, I I hear you, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, like I said, in terms of in terms of model size and so forth, yes, I think it's possible. So I think like there is this idea like that um, you know that um, Elon Musk sells that the that neural networks are going to going to be the answer to autonomous driving, and it's unclear. I mean, there's still you know the networks have gotten better, but you know like a lot of times where you sort of, you have a problem, so you try to push in that problem and another problem pops out. And I've seen that in engineering where you can get things like this in, in this intelligent processing. So I think there's a potential, uh, it is possible that we, you could hit a limit where you, you just keep pushing it on one problem, but another one pops out, that's possible. I don't have a good answer to that, but in general, getting more data is usually good. A couple questions in the back, yeah. So let me start a back row if that's okay. So in that case, with that kind of an issue with the size and everything from network, um, do you think that's a problem that can be solved by data scientists? Or do you think 
that can be replaced as well by AI computing? Um, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I think data scientists, I, I honestly, I think it's up to data scientists to address those questions. And, and as I mentioned, I mean, we, there, it's very common now that we're using, in a sense, we're using AIs to design the next generation networks. We are. We're using AIs to explore. So we don't have to say, oh, what if I just, instead of five layers, if I had six layers, or if I had 1024 neurons instead of 512 and so forth. So all that is now automated. So as you might expect, and there are AIs that are sort of trying to intelligently explore the space. So some of it is being automated. I mean, to say that it's AI, is maybe a little bit of a stretch, you know, that, that you know, because we like to think of it as the machine is somehow using the same um, intuition. Like when I did this example, the first few times I tried it, and by the way, of course, the, the result is not super satisfying. Um, I think if you squint, you could probably have told me who that is. At least some of them look like Danny DeVito. I'm not sure how many of them look like Schwarzenegger. Um, but I only trained it uh, for this case, I trained it only for 12 hours. I have another example, I trained it for 16 hours. Uh, but this, uh, I think we'd actually get some pretty good results if I trained this, you know, more like 50 or 100 hours. This was done using um, uh, using the, the NVIDIA Titan X, which is one of the most, it's not anymore the most powerful, but it's extremely capable uh, uh, accelerator for, for this development. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I answer your question, but I think that that still, like, I had to tweak some of these things. The first thing, the time I tried it, it crashed basically. Like there was a divergence where I went immediately to infinity, not a number and so forth. So like I had to use some human intelligence to do this. Now, you know, could somebody have set up a thing that I probably that you could embed some of the, there are sort of known tips and tricks for GANs to try to solve some of these problems. So you could sort of explore some of those things. I imagine, you know, more and more of that's going to be automated. Your question was how much are humans going to be in a loop? I think humans are going to be in a loop for the foreseeable future, but I don't know how long that well, is. Like data scientists. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. The humans, the data scientists in the loop. That, that I think that it's going to be up to them to make the real advances, even though we're going to use computers as power tools. But yeah, I, one more question and I want to continue. Yes. Um, I have a question about what, what this process is exactly. Um, you said there's 400... There's a four random numbers. Random numbers that are randomly generated. Yes. And then how does that turn into a picture? So there are here 25 different sets of 400 random numbers. So just like, let's yes. call it a vector, a, a set of 400 random numbers. And each one of them represents a different drawing, 400 random numbers. Yes. And each one of them produced a different picture. And you can sort of see where the network is going. Sometimes it it diddles between some things. So how did that happen? It's training, and the training is is this generator training, that phase two, where we're training the generator based on how to make it fool the discriminator. So all it's trying to do is make somehow train its weights. It, it's a neural network. It just has weights. And, and every, every pixel on that screen is connected to a neuron. That's right. And then that has 12 layers deep. Uh, you know, yeah, at the output, we have three planes. Uh, in this case, I made them 128 by 128 by red, green, blue. So the output of this is 128 by 128 by three. That's my image is out. Each of these represents a 128 by 128 image. Okay. And uh, in, the media, in the middle of the network, there are all kinds of different representations. Actually, the images start out small and they get progressively bigger. They start out as four by four, eight by eight, 16 by 16. They, they eventually grow by factors of two. Um, but uh, I I think we're, uh, this is not a good forum to go into much more I detail. I don't quite understand, like, I mean, I, I understand now better how you're making a picture, but then, like, how are you, is there, are you just judging, like, what percentage of the pixels are the correct color? All we're judging, ultimately, is did we fool the discriminator? And you can sort of see that we didn't do a great job. Of, ultimately, the discriminator was, got to about 80% accuracy, so it did a pretty good job of identifying fakes. The generator in its phase, it was down below, on average, down below 10% um, uh, in terms of its score, which means that it only got it to say real 10% of the time. So, um, and, but these numbers, actually these traces, these plots are not really the bottom line. The bottom line is because you can have plots that look this bad in that way, the, the, the red and blue, but still make good pictures. So the thing that matters is, are the, is what comes out actually useful. 
And in this case, of course, I think we'd probably say not really, but you know, you could imagine that with uh, more training, I mean, people have done these same networks and gotten um, results that look quite polished. So let me just say, uh, I've already mentioned it takes a long time. Um, so I'll just quickly say a couple of the applications. Um, I know I'm sort of out of time, but I don't know, is our next speaker here already? Is someone, is somebody here? Okay, so somebody, uh, I'll just say real quickly. So my applications that I've looked at, one of them is analysis of rotating machines. I work with Dr. Muhammad Alabsi, who's a mechanical engineering professor here at PCNJ. He's got a rig in his lab that he's got this um, fairly powerful electric motor uh, hooked up to uh, some instrumentation and loads. And what we explore is the ability for neural networks to classify faults. So um, at, at Case Western, they created a data set by they took the ball bearings in a rotating machine. They took the races that the ball bearings run around in and they drilled pits in them, seven mil pits, seven mil, seven thousandth of an inch, 14 thousandth of an inch and so forth. And we, we can classify that. And it turns out it's a pretty easy problem to classify those Case Western um, data sets. So what we measure there is not images, we measure basically, it's not really sound, but you can think of a sound. It's vibration. I mean, it's basically, if you play the, through a speaker, it actually is in the range of human hearing. You can actually hear the vibrations. And by looking at the vibrations, we can classify what the what's going on, what exactly the size of the fault, whether it's a fault on the ball bearings or the bearing races and so forth. Um, and our work uses GANs to what we call polish the data so that we can train on the Case Western data, but now apply that or transfer that learning to other machines effectively. So for example, um, our work, um, the, the, the interesting thing here is the bottom couple lines went from 50 to 90, 59 to 97% accuracy, 50% to 82% accuracy. So by using a GAN, we were able to um, improve the ability to be able to train on like this artificial set of data but, but actually apply it to a, another set of data. And that's important because if you want to use this for, let's say, um, these uh, wind turbines that they're putting up and use this technology, you, you can't do the same thing in every machine you want to do this. In other words, you can't drill the pits and take your labeled data. You, you want to be able to make a network once and be able to use it multiple times. And this GAN approach would allow us to, uh, to, to do this data polishing where we can do the transfer learning. Um, why don't we take questions privately at this point, just because I want to say basically, uh, well, maybe I'll skip to the end. So um, I did, um, I'll just quickly go through this. I did this robotic lawn weeder and we used the GAN to produce more realistic looking images that we could use to train the, um, the robot. Um, people have used it for, as I said, autonomous driving to make images. Um, and you can do things like colorizing. People have done things where they put sunglasses on people or change items from plastic to metal and all that, change the surfaces. Um, but the, I guess the main thing I want to say is just the takeaway is that uh, most AI these days means deep neural networks and artificial neuron is just a sum of products. Practical neural network can have millions of neurons and billions of connections. The GAN involves this competition, the generative discriminator, and training GANs is not easy. And um, the last thing is Dr. Jeffrey Hinton. I, this to me was very interesting, so I just put it out there because I know it's a topic that's probably of interest to a lot of you. Jeffrey Hinton, who is um, the, the, whatever you want to say, he's responsible for almost all of the major breakthroughs in the last 50 years in AI. He was trained at University of Cambridge and University of Edinburgh, and he count, he's uh, been a professor, still a professor at University of Toronto and was a VP at Google. He quit his job because he decided he was so concerned. He said, I'm sounding an alarm. We have to worry about this. It'll very quickly realize it's getting more control when it's when I say it. This is Hinton saying that AI is getting more control is a good sub goal. And these things get carried away. And you know, if these things get carried away with getting more control, we're in trouble. It's conceivable that humanity is just a passing phase. If we allow it to take over, it would be bad for all of us. So basically saying we all ought to be able to cooperate and trying to stop it. He's very worried about AI. And then I would say that I do not share his concerns, but he's much smarter than I am. So I'll leave you with that final thought. Um, thank you very much.